I know. I'm trying to see if there's anyone I know. Oh, I know those people. Not that many. Is there anyone who knows me? I know of you. It's all lies. It's all lies. Ladies and gentlemen, we're all adults. And we know as adults that there are times when common sense trumps the rules. So I'm going to break one of your rules right now. And it's possible that my friend Bill Walton is going to haul me off of here with one of those big old canes, you know. But I'm going to break one of your rules right now. I, I cannot leave Laguna Niguel today without having somehow or other, I need at least $25 million in pledges. And I'm going to tell you why. And that's the substance of my talk. First of all, we're running out of time. We're running out of time. And so what I'm about to explain to you, it's not only timely, it's extremely urgent. You might be able to see just barely this little lapel pin I have here, which a member of the Trump family uh, gave me last Saturday. We had a two and a half hour lunch. It has a presidential seal on it. I really like it. Not a Trump supporter, not a conservative, not a Republican, not a conservative bone in my body. But I do believe in America, I believe in democracy, I believe in the free and fair election. And if we do not act immediately to stop the big tech companies, they will own this country as of November. They have the power to shift 15 million votes without anyone knowing that they've done so and without leaving a paper trail for authorities to trace. I know how to stop them. No laws or regulations can stop them at this point. And the fact is, even if by some miracle, some law or regulation was put in place trying to stop them, you would still need to set up what's called a monitoring system to see if they're complying with the laws or regulations. Now, because of the work I've been doing now, research I've been doing for over seven years, some of my closest friends have turned out to be people like Peter Schweitzer, uh, the guy who wrote Clinton Cash, and most recently, uh, Profiles in Corruption, which I'm reading right now, which is quite good. And, you know, my, my new conservative friends tend to be extremely overconfident. You know why they're overconfident? Because they don't, they're not taking tech into account. And they're looking at all these swing states saying, well, Trump won them last time and the economy is great. No problem. But last time, the tech companies were taking for granted that Hillary had this thing locked in. And they swore, they took an oath on what they call Armageddon Day. You call it Election Day 2016. They call it Armageddon Day. They took an oath that day that they would not allow Trump to be reelected. And what they're doing now, now, is they are targeting every single individual in every single swing state, the individuals who are uncommitted, undecided. They're targeting them right this second and using every single technique that they have at their disposal. And I've been studying those techniques since 2013. And they are shifting opinions. They're shifting who registers to vote and who doesn't. They're shifting voting preferences. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what Brad Parscale, whom I know, used to be Trump's tech advisor, now he's his uh, campaign manager. I heard, heard from him three times yesterday. It doesn't matter what the Trump campaign does. It doesn't matter what the senators do who are up for re-election. Okay, if, if we don't get the tech companies to back off, 
then we will not have a free and fair election. Not only will the Democrats sweep Washington, but they will take over Washington, as they did during Obama's second term. The first thing that Obama did in January of 2013, when his second term began, first thing he did after someone from Google visited him was to shut down the antitrust investigation against Google. It's the first thing he did. Within a short time, six federal agencies in Washington were being run by former Google executives. His chief technology officer, former Google executive. Hillary Clinton's chief technology officer, Stephanie Hannon, former Google executive. Okay, Google, and to a lesser extent Facebook, they will take over Washington, and it is actually their goal to take over the world. And they're working with the Chinese on that. You might think of them as an American company. Certainly, the Europeans do. That's why the Europeans keep attacking them. But they don't think of themselves that way. They think of themselves as utopians here to create a better world according to company values. You think I'm making that up? There's a video that leaked from Google about a year and a half ago called The Creepy Line, made to be seen eyes only within the company, select few, eight minute video, and it's about the power that Google has to re-engineer humanity according to company values. And that is what I study. Now, a couple of days ago in the Epic Times, I published a piece I'd recommend to all of you called Why Republicans Can't Win in 2020. Uh, Glenn Beck and some other people just interviewed me about this. Uh, the Glenn Beck interview on his TV show will air, I think, on Wednesday. He's held me on his radio show on Monday. I'm doing other shows, too. The reason why I'm mentioning Glenn, though, is because Glenn needs me to come to him with at least $25 million in pledges because then he is, he's committed to this. He's committed to it on the air. He will organize all of the talk show hosts in the country, and they will do a fundraiser, and they will match that amount. And that is what is needed to set up a large-scale monitoring system in all 50 states so that we can look over the shoulders of a diverse group of American voters, with their permission, of course, and see what the tech companies are showing them. Why do we have to do that? Why is there no substitute, for, in fact, for doing that? Why do we have to look over the shoulders of a diverse group of American voters, real people, to find out what the tech companies are doing, what the shenanigans are? <sighs> because. <laughs> because these companies tailor what they're showing people to the individual. And they know who is a real person and who isn't. They know who, they, they know who a bot is because a bot doesn't have a history in their, in their system. A bot doesn't have a profile. So you have to see what these companies are showing real people. You have to keep their identities secret. This is exactly what the Nielsen Company has been doing since the 1950s when they monitor people's television watching. And we will aggregate those data as they're coming in. We will analyze massive amounts of data as it's coming in from thousands of field agents. And we will spot bias in search results, which can easily shift between 20 and 80% of undecided voters after just one search. That's how powerful that is. That's called the search engine manipulation effect, which I published about in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2015, replicated it in 2017, published another big replication. It's been replicated by a, uh, one of the Max Planck Institutes in Europe. We have to look at search suggestions that Google is flashing at people because we know from our experiments that just by manipulating search suggestions, we can turn a 50-50 split among undecided voters into a 90-10 split with no one having the slightest idea that they've been manipulated. That's the search suggestion effect. Then there's DDE, the differential demographics effect. You might recall in 2018, Google, instead of having the word Google on their home page, which would, be, would have been seen on election day in 2018 by, would have been seen 500 million times that day just by Americans. Google replaced the word Google with the colorful words, go vote. And they drew tremendous praise. Wow, what a great public service. They're urging people to go vote. That was not a public service, that was a vote manipulation. That's something we study, it's called the differential demographics effect. Google knows very well what the demographics are of the, 
people who use the search engine and they know that more Democrats and left-leaning people use it than right-leaning people. And that one manipulation that day gave at least 800,000 more votes to Democrats across the country in the midterm elections than to Republicans. Now that's if they were showing it to everyone. What if they were showing it just to Democrats and people leaning left? In that case, they could have shifted over four million more votes to Democrats than to Republicans. Now that's spread across hundreds of races, but still. What I'm saying is there are things that are happening now that people don't understand, they don't see. We just started a series of experiments on what we're calling YME, the YouTube manipulation effect. I think this is gonna be bigger than seem, bigger than the, the power that search results have to shift opinions. Because did you know now that 70% of the videos that people watch on YouTube around the world are suggested by Google's top secret up next algorithm? So you go to YouTube, you search for a video, you watch the video, there's a 70% chance that the next video you watch is gonna be the one that their, their algorithm is suggesting. They have the ability to take people down rabbit holes. There have been people who've been radicalized to radical Islam, uh, to white supremacy by a sequence of YouTube videos. Anyway, I've figured out how to quantify this effect, how to study it very precisely, and how to quantify it to show what kind of impact this can have on elections, and for that matter, on attitudes, beliefs, purchases, this is frightening stuff. I've identified about a dozen techniques like this, and I'm sure there are many more. What we have to do is put a monitoring system, a large-scale system into effect. I set up smaller-scale systems in 2018 and 2016. I testified before Congress last summer about uh, the monitoring systems I've done and all of the, the uh, uh, experimental research I've done, the controlled randomized experiments, which now have been done with tens of thousands of people involving five national elections in four countries. Shortly after that, President Trump, this was August of, of last year, tweeted about my research. And some of you may know what happened next, which was that Hillary Clinton, whom I've supported for 20 years, along with her husband, tweeted back at him, at the president, saying that my work had been debunked and was based on data from 21 undecided voters. What, what, what? Then the New York Times echoed everything that she said, amplified that, no fact checking, and then a hundred other mainstream news organizations followed. And my reputation, which has been spotless, had been spotless as a scholar and scientist for almost 40 years, was completely destroyed. I started having chest pains. In October, I had a heart attack. My life was saved, oddly enough, by someone you probably heard of named Dennis Prager. We don't have time. Yes, I like Dennis too. And I really should write an article about that and thanking him and uh, because he, he actually did save my life. It's, it's a crazy story, don't have time to tell you right now. Um, somewhere along the way that summer, there was a, a meeting of AGs. I've been working with state AGs for a long, long time. And there was a very small exclusive meeting of some of them who were about to launch this huge antitrust action, which now involves 51 AGs. And I've been involved with them really since the beginning. So there was a very small select group of key people, I'm not gonna name any names, I told them about my latest work. I told them about my fears about regarding the 2020 election. And one of these AGs came up to me afterwards, looked me straight in the eye, deadly serious, and he said, Dr. Epstein, I think that sometime in the next few months, you're gonna die in an accident. In December, my beautiful wife, who I'd been together with for eight and a half years, was killed in a car accident, which has some suspicious elements to it, which are still being investigated. (sighs) 
My eldest son, I have five kids, sums it up this way. He's telling people, my dad had a bad quarter. And then he usually adds, it's because he has principles. And he does air quotes. It's because he has principles. So I, I haven't recovered from any of that. But you know what? I've, I've, I've dragged myself out of bed. And I am telling you, I need your help. We have to get the system set up immediately. Glenn Beck is standing by to help. There are other people standing by to help. The, 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 and then there's this. This is a draft of an executive order which the president is likely to sign sometime in the next few weeks. And this executive order calls for a report to be written by a federal agency within 90 days, completed within 90 days, looking into the possibility that big tech companies are undermining the free and fair election in the United States at the local, state, and federal level. And it mentions monitoring systems. And it refers to some of my testimony before Congress. Is there anyone in this room who can help me get these pledges set up? Because I need these pledges. And I'm going to actually ask for a show of hands to see if there's anyone here. I know I'm breaking your rules. And you know, Bill is probably having a fit right now. But is there anyone here who can help me today before I leave town to find this money. I don't need the cash right now. I need the pledges so I can turn them over to Glenn. Robert, I have a better idea. Yeah. You're going to have a book signing afterwards. Ah. And I think we'd invite people to talk with you during the book OK, so you probably couldn't hear that, but uh, Bill Walton suggests that if you want to talk to me about this, about helping me do this, uh, come to my book signing. And when is the book signing? 3 o'clock. It's at 3 o'clock. And as a bonus, um, I talked to, uh, I talked to uh, um, uh, Schweitzer's uh, associates uh, who had helped uh, put together this wonderful documentary film called The Creepy Line, which is about the, the threats that, uh, that the big tech companies pose, uh, not just to democracy, but to human autonomy around the world. Uh, the three big threats being surveillance, which is completely out of hand. You realize your phones are listening in to my talk and transmitting it to two companies right now. The second is censorship, which of course is affecting conservatives much more than it's affecting liberals. And the third area is manipulation, where a lot of my research focuses. And The Creepy Line is all about that. It's a fantastic documentary that Peter Schweitzer you know, put together. Uh, if you buy one of my books, and especially if you include a million dollar check with that, you will get a free copy, a free DVD copy of The Creepy Line. And that's courtesy of Schweitzer and those people who put the film together. So. Um, I urge you to do that, and you know why don't I just at this point open it up for a couple of questions because we do have five minutes. And I apologize for breaking your rules, but again, sometimes common sense, the, exigen the exigencies of the moment trump rules. I hope you all agree with that. Yes, sir. And please identify, identify yourself. Uh, I, I've heard you speak on radio several times, and. Very, very impressed by your work. Uh, it seems to me that um, even with regulations, you can't stop them. That's what you just basically told us. So my question right. is, my question is uh, how do you shut down the internet for, say, 30 days before the election? <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. I'm yeah, no, I understand. Look, 
you, you can't stop them with regulations. You, that's true. You cannot, because the, they write the regulations, it turns out. Uh, they, you can't stop them with law. And of course, our Congress is, tends to be dysfunctional, so it's really tough. I mean, I had a four-hour private dinner with, with Ted Cruz uh, a couple of months ago, just the two of us talking nonstop about tech for four hours. We never talked politics, never, because we didn't want to fight. But the point is that, uh, no, you can't, you can't stop them with law or regulation because tech changes very, very fast, okay? But you can stop them now and in the future with monitoring systems. That's another reason we have to set up this system because this system will show whether there's compliance, of course, with any laws or regulations. But more important, when we find irregularities of any sort, we find bias of any sort, we find suppression of tweets. My friend Ann Coulter uh, insists that a lot of her tweets to her millions of followers never reach her followers. And Twitter's known for doing that. That's shadow banning, and they're known for doing that. We will detect it. We will detect it. And the moment we detect it, we will announce it. We'll expose it. We will, we will hand over data to the Federal Election Commission, to members of the media, uh, to members of Congress, other authorities. See what I'm saying? Monitoring systems can keep up with tech. Whatever tech is doing, monitoring systems can keep up because monitoring is tech. And these, these people who run these companies, they would be total idiots to keep using these manipulations when they're being exposed over and over and over again because they'll, they will pay stiff penalties, they'll pay fines, and some of them eventually will be sent to jail. Dot. Dr. Epstein, I'm Jenny Beth Martin with Tea Party Patriots. Hi. And I know it's hard to see up there with those lights. I have a very good Tea Party friend. His name is Tom Zawistowski. Yeah, He's from no Ohio. Oh, from Ohio, yeah, that's right. Um, I'd love to have you on Facebook Live so you can talk about what you need and, and the information that you have. If people in here are going to respond to you, what organization would they be doing it as a 501c3? Uh, it's, it's, uh, the initials are A-I-B-R-T. So it's at aibrt.org.org. It is a 501c3 public charity. That's where I do my work. Uh, my email, if you want to email me directly, I'm my initials, re at aibrt.org. AIBRT stands for American Institute for Behavioral Research and Technology. And, uh, you know, we're small, but we do some very, very unusual work, which people at major universities won't do because they're getting too much money from Google. Oh, yes. Please identify yourself. Yes, uh, Donald DePinto. Uh, hello. Yes, hello. Uh, is, you mentioned you're a behavioral scientist. Yes. Right. Harvard PhD. B.F. Skinner's last doctoral student. I recognize both <laughs> the, um, would, would Google be as effective in prior generations? Is this, uh, are, are they, is this generation more susceptible, susceptible to those suggestions and YouTubes and various other than perhaps the generation of my father? <clears throat> and number two, is there any competing uh, search engines and various other things that you can suggest where we don't have to rely on Google. Uh, I obviously don't use it very much or what I want it, it's very specific. And I don't think I'm influenced by, at all by them. I think they're idiots. Well, that, that's an excellent question. And the website you want to go to uh, to see my article on this topic is my7simplesteps.com. My7simplesteps.com. You can spell out seven or use the, use the uh, numeral, doesn't matter. And my, my first sentence is, uh, I have not received a targeted ad since 2014. <laughs> so yes, there are some alternatives or ways you can use the internet uh, and still protect your privacy and the privacy of your family. The generation, generational issue, well, yes, our, our children are extremely vulnerable because they're just immersed in the technological world. I went to my daughter's bedroom one night just to check on her. I have two daughters and three sons. And there were five electronic devices around her pillow. 
So, you know, they're, they're just growing up in a different world. But also, you know, these companies never existed before. You know, Western Union fixed the presidential election of 1876. Uh, that's been well documented. Um, but, you know, because they had, they had a monopoly on nationwide communications through the telegraph. That's how they did it. Uh, but what Google and Facebook have is orders of magnitude more dangerous. And they have this ability to shift opinions, votes, and so on around the world. They're impacting now more than two and a half billion people every day. Within the next two or three years, that number will exceed four billion. A tiny number of executives in Silicon Valley who are not accountable to us, they hold all of that power. There's no precedent for that in, in human history, none. And the te techniques themselves, they're the most powerful behavioral effects. I've been in the behavioral sciences for 40 years. They're the most be powerful behavioral effects ever discovered. They're invisible to people. And they use ephemeral, ephemeral content, or within Google, secretly, they call it ephemeral experiences, which means it's, it's material generated on the fly just for you as an individual user, like search results or news feeds. And then it disappears, and it's not stored anywhere. So no one, no authorities can go back in time and figure out what they were showing you. 2018 leak of Google emails to the Wall Street Journal. One of the employees at Google says, how can we use ephemeral experiences to change people's views about Trump's travel ban? I'm not imagining this stuff. This is real. This is what the Google whistleblowers are telling us now over and over and over again. We need to pay attention to what they're saying. And we need to pay attention to the research I've been doing and we need to pay attention to, as far as I know, what is the only way to get these companies to back off in 2020, and that is with a large-scale monitoring system. I will see, I hope, some of you at 3 o'clock at the book signing. Thank you. Wait, wait. I just think, I know a lot of people in here, Robert's obviously going through a lot. Can we pray for him? We'd like to pray for you, if that's okay. Okay. Father, we uh, thank you for this man and how he's been standing for truth, how you've been using him to expose things. And we know that the enemy would like to cause harm in his life, would like to cause him fear. Uh, we pray that you would, that you're much more powerful than these uh, forces against him. We pray that you would protect him, that you would protect his family, that you would allow nothing to touch any of them, that your power, which is much more powerful than evil, would win out, and that his truth would get out, and that you would find the avenues for that to get out, and that people would surround him and his family, and he would know that he's loved, and that he's supported, and that people won't let anything happen to him. And we leave this in your hands, and ask that you would take care of this, because we trust in you. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.